just making just a couple quick quick announcements before we go to the Word of God. Uh, remember, we have ladies' Bible studies at this Thursday. Uh, Tracy Fry is visiting this morning. We're glad to, to have her. Glad to have Chad Garrett with us this morning. Glad you're here. Uh, Oh, I'm not sure I'm going to... Udy McMillan? Udy McMillan. We're glad you're here with us this morning. And uh, Trenton Cantrell, we're, we're so happy to have that you're visiting today. I don't... <laughs> and if, if I didn't mention your name, it's because you didn't fill out a visitor card, but we're glad to have you anyway. <laughs> um, we will be baptizing Elijah after, after, after the Word of God. So uh, if you want to see that, don't run away. Have I covered everything? I have, I think. I'm kind of, I'm kind of taking my time. <laughs> We're going to go to the word of the Lord today. And I'll just be honest with you. What I'm about to preach on my wife can tell you I've probably not been this nervous to preach in a long, long time. Um, it's been a weird experience for me because there are parts of me that are excited and then there are parts of me that are terrified. And it's kind of a weird feeling to be in. Uh, for those of you who can... Stand without pain. By the way, if you're here with us and we're worshiping, we're standing, you don't have to stand. But if you can stand without pain, we're going to read the word of the Lord. We're going to go to Mark chapter 2. And we're going to read, start with verse 15 in Mark chapter 2. Now it happened as he was dining in Levi's house that he is Jesus that many tax collectors and sinners also sat together with Jesus and his disciples, for they were many and they followed him. And when the scribes and the Pharisees saw him eating with the tax collectors and sinners, they said to his disciples, how is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well, have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Please put that title slide up there. Many of you are going to instinctively have a problem with that title. Bear with me, because it is a true statement. And we're going to talk about it. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we need you to be in this house. Help us to hear, Lord God. Help me, Jesus, to, to speak truth, Lord God. Help me, Lord Jesus, to do my absolute best. And help us to receive and hear what your spirit is trying to say to us, Lord God. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated this morning. That Levi that's referenced in verse 15, that's Levi Matthew, that's one of God's, one of Jesus' disciples. And he is a tax collector. Now, when we think of tax collectors, we think of the IRS. That's not, that's not what the tax collectors were back then. Because the, the government that they were collecting taxes for was not the Jews' government. It was the Romans. It was conquerors. It was occupiers. So those tax collectors were taking taxes from the people, and it wasn't going to public works. It wasn't going to supporting uh, roads. It was going back to Rome, to people who hated the Jews, who thought the Jews were scum. And so if a Jewish man was a tax collector, he was not just a tax collector. He was also a traitor to his own people. 
And so they say, here's, here's Jesus calling one of these people to be his disciples. And then not only are there tax collectors that are eating together with Jesus and his disciples, but there are sinners. That covers everything else. And along come the Pharisees and the scribes, the, the, the religious people. You know, <laughs> why, why is this teacher, why is this man from God spending time with traitors and sinners? Why is he eating with them? Why is he spending any time with them? Truly, if he was a holy man, if he truly came from God, surely he would know that those are bad people. Stay away from them. And Jesus responds to them. And he said, hey, those who are sick don't need a doctor. I've come to call sinners to repentance, not the righteous. Jesus had come to call sinners. He had come to call people who knew who they were. The tax collectors didn't have to guess that nobody liked them. They knew nobody liked them. The sinners that were there knew that's what everybody thought that they were. So they knew that they needed somebody to help them. The funny thing is, is the Pharisees and the scribes also needed Jesus. They were just as sick as the tax collectors. They were just as much sinners as everybody else they called sinners. They just refused to admit it. They just refused to see it. They just refused to understand that as much as that tax collector needed God, they needed God. Once when I was uh, teaching on pain, I, I studied a condition called SIPA. It's a C-I-P-A. SIPA, people who suffer from SIPA literally cannot feel pain at all. And also, uh, they can't sweat. I don't know why those are two related, but they can't feel pain. So if they cut themselves, they won't even realize it because they won't feel pain. If they burn themselves, they don't, won't realize it because they can't feel the pain from that burn. And so when we think about that, uh, they, they could catch gangrene. They could, they, they're vulnerable to, to bleeding to death because they could be bleeding and not even realize that they're bleeding. Most SEPA sufferers don't live past the age of 20. They don't live out of their 20s. But the killer of most SEPA sufferers is not wounds, not cuts, not burns. It's heat stroke. Because when your body starts to suffer heat stroke, you start to get a headache and you start to feel something, and they can't feel that. And so they will literally stay out in the sun or stay in a hot situation until their body is so overheated that they die because they can't feel it, because they don't know that they're sick, because they don't realize that there's a problem. Come on. <sighs> read one verse for you. And you got to hear it. Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That all included the Pharisees. That all includes the scribes. That all includes us. We've all need to be, need Jesus. Jesus tried to reach the Pharisees. He didn't ignore them. In, in Luke chapter 11, he spoke, as he spoke, a certain Pharisee asked him to dine with him. And so he went in and sat down to eat. And when the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he had not first washed before dinner and the Lord said to him, now you Pharisees, you make the outward of the cup and dish clean, 
But your inward part is full of greed and wickedness. He says, you Pharisees, you're so focused on what's on the outside that you don't understand. You can't see. You don't understand. The inside is messed up. And he kept trying to reach them. He goes on to call them. You say, you're hypocrites. You say one thing and you do another. But they didn't hear the words of Jesus, the majority of them. Couldn't hear that because they just, they couldn't understand. We're religious. We follow the rules. We follow the laws of Moses. And so those words didn't drive them to change. Instead, it just made them angry. They hated Jesus with a passion because Jesus came along and said, you're not as good as you think you are. You're not... uh, You're not as stand-up as you think you are. They had sin. They just refused to acknowledge it. See, in order to repent, you have to first understand you're a sinner and need Jesus. If you don't understand that, you can't repent. And if you can't repent, God cannot help you. If you don't know you're sick, if you don't know you need Jesus, there's nothing God can do for you. That's alien to how a lot of people talk. But it's the truth. See, the thing is, is a lot of times... We blind ourselves to our own condition. Matthew chapter 13, Jesus was talking to his disciples. Matthew 13, starting with verse 13, he says, Therefore I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand it. And in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing. Their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. God said in the Old Testament, he said there are going to be people that their physical vision, Amberlynn, is just fine. But they can't see spiritual things. Their physical hearing, A-OK. But they won't understand, they'll, they'll hear spiritual things, but they'll refuse to understand them. Hear the voice of the Lord there. If they would turn, I would heal them. But they won't turn because they refuse to see and they refuse to hear. In other words, God's standing there saying, I can't help them. Oh, that sounds so strange, Brother Tim. That sounds so weird that that people hearing the voice of Jesus would ignore him. My friend, that happens all the time. Revelations chapter 3. Jesus sends a message, Jagger, to a bunch of church people. He sends it to a church. He sends a letter to a church. In other words, he is sending this letter to people that are saved. He's sending this letter to people who go to church on Sundays, that go to Bible study, that sing songs, that read the Bible. And he sends this message to them. He says, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot, I could wish you were cold or hot. 
So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. That's gross. Yeah. That should tell you how God feels about them. But listen to this. Because you, who's that you? The Laodicean Christians. Because you say I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing. And do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. The Laodicean Christians were saying, we're wealthy. We're perfect. God, we don't need any of your help. And Jesus sends them a message and says, don't you understand? When I look at you, I don't see wealth. I don't see perfection. When I look at you, I see that you are wretched. I see that you are miserable. I see that you are poor. I see that you are blind and naked. I see that you need me. In their eyes, everything was okay. In their eyes, they didn't need God. But Jesus is trying to reach them. Jesus is telling them who they are. Not who they think they are. Not who they try to present themselves. Jesus is saying, no, This is what you are. He's trying to bring them to a place where he can help them. He's trying to bring them to a place where they'll understand they do need him. He's trying to bring them to a place where his hands aren't tied. Why would people do that? What are warning signs that you may need to worry about this, or I may need to worry about this? One of them is if I'm always justifying my actions because I'm better than somebody else. Well, I'm a liar and a manipulator, but I'm not a thief. And as long as I'm not a thief, I'm okay. And then the thief comes along and says, well, I'm a thief, but I'm not a drug dealer. As long as I'm not a drug dealer, I'm okay. And the drug dealer comes along and he says, well, I'm a drug dealer, but that guy over there, he's a murderer. As long as I don't kill anybody, I'll be okay. And then you got the murderer who's come along, look, look, I don't torture him before I kill him. I just kill him, so I'm better than those guys. You're laughing at this. But that's what we do. We look at other people and we go, well, as long as I'm better than him, I'm okay. In Luke chapter 18, Jesus addressed this by telling his disciples a parable. Luke 18, verse 9, he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. So this parable was to those who were going, ha, I don't need nothing, and hated people. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. And the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even this tax collector here. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. So his prayer to God is not, I need you, I need help. His prayer to God is, I'm better than this guy. Thank you. I I do all of this stuff. The tax collector prays. And the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast God, be merciful to me, a sinner. 
And the next verse, Jesus says this, I tell you, this man, the tax collector, went down to his house justified rather than the other. So the Pharisee who is standing there saying, oh, thank you, I'm not as low down as that guy over there. Jesus says it was the low down tax collector that went home justified because he understood that he needed a physician. He understood that he needed God's help. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who hum- humbles himself will be exalted. See, we're not supposed to be comparing ourselves to everybody else. Yeah. We're supposed to be comparing ourselves to God. Hayden, when we compare ourselves to God, we look pretty shabby. That's why we like comparing to other people. Well, I, I can be better than Brother B. That's... that's That's not hard. But when I look at God, I can't be better than him. Another place that might tell me that I need to worry about this is that if every bad situation I'm in is always somebody else's fault, It's never my fault. <laughs> you, know, you know me, I'm perfect. So if I'm in a bad situation, it must be Charlie. I've met many. I've actually heard people say, I don't understand why all these people are after me. And why all these people don't like me. And the truth of the matter is, it's not that they didn't like that person. It's that that person wasn't a very nice person. It wasn't that everybody was out to get them. It was that they needed to change. But as long as it's everybody else's fault, then I don't have to do anything. As long as it's everybody else's problem, then I don't need Jesus. As long as all the bad things happen to me, then I don't have to change. What might tell me that I need to worry about that is if I never, ever feel a specific conviction. What do you mean by that? If I ask right now how many of you are perfect and needed to be better, I guarantee you just about every single person's hand would raise. But if I said, tell me one place you could be better, there would be some that would not be able to answer that question. If everything's, if, if, if it's just general betterness, how does God help you with general betterness? But when I come to him and say, God, I'm terrified. My life is falling apart. Too much, well, how's it go, the, the money runs out before the month. <laughs> too, yeah, too much month, not enough money. Now God has a place to start. By the way, notice I said conviction, not condemnation. What's the difference? Conviction is something that tells you you need to change. Condemnation says you can't change. That comes from the devil. That's, he comes in, he comes in, Justin, and says, this is what you are, this is what you will always be, so you might as well just give up. That's not God. God comes in and says, Justin, I understand where you're at, but you and I together, we're going to make you different. So 
what do we do? Well, we read our Bibles. Not just our favorite verses all the time, not the same verse every day. We read all of it. And we start trying to figure out how it applies to our life, what we need to change. God did not save you for you to remain the same. He saved you to redeem you, to make you into something better. This is the guidebook. Well, we pay you to tell us what the Bible says. In a sense, am I with you 24 hours a day? Is pastor with you 24 hours a day? Is brother B with you 24 hours a day? We can't be. You need to read the word of God. You need to study it. Well, brother, it's, it's, it's more than I can understand. I get that. I understand that. It's a big book. That's, that's really what we're here for. When you come up to us and go, brother Tim, I read this verse and I'm not sure what that means. We'll sit down. Let's talk about it. Let's figure it out. That'll help you to know things that you need to change, Jill. That will help you know things where you need to be better. And how you can approach closer to God. Pray. That's another thing. But pray specifically. Not, Lord, make me better. Lord, Tired of yelling at my kids. I know it's wrong. Help me figure out what I need to do to change that behavior. <laughs> Over here he said, fix the kids. Guess what? I can't do that. And God won't do that. There's only one person that God will fix. That's the person asking the question. That's me. Your wife is mistreating you. Your husband is mistreating you. God's not going to change them. But he might be able to change you if you'll let him. And maybe given enough time of him changing you, that might cause that other spouse to go, hey, there's something different here. takes time. I don't know what to pray, Brother Tim. It's perfect. Got a prayer for you. Psalms, chapter 139. This is David. Search me, O God. Know my heart. Try me. Know my anxieties. See if there is is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. God, I know I struggle. Point it out to me. Point out where I need to change. Point out where I need to get better. Point out what I need to do different. And then be prepared for that to happen. We pray that prayer sometimes, and the Spirit says, how about this? And we go, no. No, no, I like that. And the third thing is listen to the words of people who love you. In Esther chapter 2, Esther is in the house of the women. And she's going to appear before the king. And Esther chapter 2, verse 12, it says, Each young woman's turn came to go into King Ahasuerus after she had completed 12 months of preparation according to the regulations for the women. For thus were the days of their preparation apportioned six months with oil of myrrh and six months with perfumes and preparations for beautiful women. So they didn't have a spa day, ladies. They had a spa year. Any volunteers? I see a couple, yeah. 
Thus prepared, each young woman went to the king, and she was given whatever she desired to take with her from the woman's quarters to the king's palace. They came along, and they said, it's your turn, and you can have anything that you want. What do you think they probably, the Bible doesn't say, but if you use our imagination, what they pick? Well, they picked jewels. They picked fine dresses. They, they picked everything that represented wealth and power. But Esther's turn comes. And in verse 15, now when the turn came for Esther, the daughter of Abihail, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his daughter to go into the king, she requested nothing but what Haggai, the king's eunuch, the custodian of the women, advised. And Esther obtained favor inside of all who saw her. Her turn comes. And what she does is she goes to the custodian of the, woman, of the women. And she said, tell me. I can have anything. I, I can please myself. I can have anything I want. I can, I can make my life better. I can be wealthy. I can be powerful. But she goes to the custodian of the women and she says, tell me, what does the king like? What will make the king happy? See, custodian of the women, you've been around for a while. You've seen the women come and you've seen the women go. You know what appeals to the king. You know what makes the king happy. I don't want to just take, I don't want to take random things. Tell me what I take. And it says she obtained favor. And it says that Hazuerus loved her. Why? Because she went to a man she knew, knew what the king liked, and said, what do I need to do? There are those that rule over our souls, mine as well. Hebrews 13, verse 17. You're not going to like this verse. Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch for your souls. It's not talking about the government. The government could care less about your soul. Your government doesn't even know your soul exists. Who is it talking about? It's talking about people that God has placed in your life who are going to give an account for you. Liam, when I get to heaven, Jesus is going to look at me and he's going to say, Tim, what did you do for Liam's soul? And I sure hope I have a good answer. You want to listen to them because you want them to do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable to you. There are men and women of God in your life that may approach you and say, hey, I've noticed something. You might want to consider this. I sure wish, Zach, that I could just wave my hand and change people. I can't do it. All I can do is, hey, Zach, something's been bothering me. I, and, and I'm just picking up. And I noticed this. Have you ever thought about this? Have you thought maybe that's not what God wants you to do? Not because I desire to dominate Zach's life. but Because I know my God. And I want Zach to find favor with my God. I'm going to answer for Zach's soul. When I get there, he's going to ask, Hey, did you see that problem in Coach's life? Yes, God, I did. Well, what'd you do about it? My answer better not be nothing. Now, here's the thing. 
I could tell coach what I see. I can't make him do it. We don't like that. We don't like people coming along and saying, hey, I see this. Well, I'm more spiritual than anybody in this church. I pray more, I fast more. Even those pastors aren't quite as good as me. I understand the Bible better. Fair enough. You probably do. But have you ever considered that God spoke through a bush and a donkey? I know Moses knew more than the bush and the donkey. (laughs) It's not about how much people know. It's about whether or not they're helping you. A verse that's often used is Matthew chapter 7. A lot of you are going to recognize it. Judge not that you be not judged. That's right. You say it, Braxton. Amen. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with what measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove, let me remove the speck from your, own, your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye. So Jesus says, there's a man out there. He says, hey, look, there's a speck in your eye, brother B., And I got a plank in mine. And here's the thing. You might look at me, and I might have a plank in my eye. You may be absolutely correct. But what does the next verse say? Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye. The guy with the plank needs to get rid of it. Then you will see clearly... To remove the speck. In other words, the speck is still a problem. The plank doesn't dismiss the speck. So if you look at me and go, he's got a plank in his eye and he's just pointing out a speck, so I'm just going to ignore that. You're missing the point. You still need to take care of the speck. Maybe I disqualify myself from helping you because of the plank in my eye, but you better find somebody that can help you with that speck. Number one person that'll do that is the person that looks back at you from your mirror. So don't you dare dismiss the words of somebody because they have a plank in their eye. Does that mean that they're always right? No. But if uh, somebody approaches you and says, hey, I see this in your life, step back and look. I I can see the plank. Maybe they were wrong. But I'm going to start double checking to make sure the speck is, if there's no speck in my eye. Because if I refuse to admit that there's anything wrong with me, there is nothing God can do to help me. If I go, he has a plank, so the speck's not there, God says, okay, you're going to live with the speck. (laughs) But if I hear that, if if I look at it and Luke comes to me and I see a plank in his eye, he says, you got a speck, Brother Tim? I need to say thank you. And I need to go get a mirror and start checking myself. Maybe he's wrong, but I better check myself first. It irritates me when people say that religion, that uh, Christianity is something where you turn off your brain because that is not true. If you're not using your brain in Christianity, you're not a very good Christian. Because you need to be examining yourself all the time. You need to be self-aware. You need to know not only what you do, but why you do it. (laughs) 
Why don't you stand with me? I knew this was not going to be a uh, rip-roaring shout and service. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul, verse 1, says, Therefore, have, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh. He's talking to Christians. He's saying, hey, Christians, you need to cleanse yourself of the flesh and the spirit, perfecting holiness as to the fear of God. I didn't want to leave you without hope. So we're going to go back to Revelation chapter 3, the message to the Laodiceans. Jesus tells them, I know your works, you're neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot, so then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. If we stop there, boy, would we be in trouble. But Jesus goes on to say, I counsel you. Buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich. White garments that you may be clothed. The shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. Anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone, including those people that were poor, wretched, blind, and naked, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Am I going to be perfect? No. If you're looking for me to be perfect, I'm going to disappoint you probably 100% of the time. But what I'm looking to do is to find the gold that God has refined so that I can get it. I'm looking to find the white garments that he has prepared for me to cover my shame. I want to anoint my eyes with eye salve so that I can see what God wants and see what God's doing. I often pray this, sitting in this room. God, open our eyes to see. Open our ears to hear. God is moving through this room. He does it every single time we gather together. The question is never, will God do something? The answer to that question is yes. Instead, the question is, will I let God do something? Will I allow God to reach me? Will I allow him? Will I admit that I make mistakes? Will I be humble enough to say, God, help me? Or am I going to walk out the same way I came in? Many, many times, myself included. Myself included. I walk out the same way I came in. And the sad thing is, is I don't have to. Would you bow your heads with me, Lord? Help us to hear your voice, see your hand. Help us to respond to you, Jesus, and allow you to move in our hearts and our lives. Move in this place, touch your people. We want to draw close to you, Jesus. We want to be near to you, God. Help us. Help us to see. Help us to hear. As they begin to sing, this altar is open. Come, seek the face of the Lord. Or if you want to, right in your seat, you can turn around and pray. Or you can sit down and pray. But begin to seek the Lord today. 
In a couple moments, we're going to baptize Elijah in the precious name of Jesus. But come and spend a few moments in prayer this morning. He decided at the fields of faith that he needed to be baptized. So that's what we're going to do today, in the precious name of Jesus. Before we do that, I'd like y'all, if you'd stretch your hands, we're going to take a moment and pray for you.
Elijah, Phoenix, James Stalkup. I now baptize you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. In Jesus' name. My clothes are already wet, so if anybody else wants to get baptized, now's the time. The Lord will welcome you, willing to do it. Thank you all for being here today. Thank Tim when you see him for what an awesome preaching that was. I mean, for real. Thank him. He did a really good job. Remember, you're carrying out of here the most valuable thing on earth of all the earth's possessions combined. 
You carry it within you. It's called your soul. If it wasn't so valuable, God wouldn't be after it. Take that with you today. Y'all have a blessed week.